Hello, I'm Paul Briley, and you're listening to Off the Comma. I'm a human who cares about supporting other humans. On this podcast, we explore all facets of what it means to feel stuck in life. We talk with people just like us who found themselves sitting on a comma and not knowing where to go next. We'll unpack the experience with them, where they've been stuck, what it feels like, what they experienced, and what they learned. My goal is to inspire you by seeing yourself in others. I believe that when we feel more connected and seen, magic can happen. And remember, if you find yourself sitting on a comma in your life, you can also talk to me without a microphone. To explore coaching with me and getting off the comma in your own life, check out my information and book a call with me at offthecomma.com. And I'm also doing something different. I'm curating my own sponsor community, local businesses and professionals who I handpick and who align with our vision here. Be sure to check them out, learn more about them on my website and my YouTube channel. In the meantime, let's get into this week's conversation conversation. Have you thought about becoming a professional life coach? Let's talk about transformation and coach training. I attended Transformative Coaching Essentials, a one-year coach training program based in Sacramento, hosted by McLaren Coaching. This one-year intensive program is truly life-changing. If you've thought about starting a coaching business, becoming a better leader, improving relationships, or just want personal growth and change, then I recommend you talk to Cami McLaren about TCE. The next program starts on July 27th, 2024. Sign up now and mention this ad to get $250 off your tuition. Learn more at mclarencoaching.com backslash coach hyphen training. That's McLaren, M-C-L-A-R-E-N. Better yet, you can email Cami. that's C-A-M-I, at mclarencoaching.com, or you can also contact me, and I'm happy to talk to you about my transformative experience with TCE and how it can change your life too. And we're back with another exciting episode of Off the Comma, the podcast. And this week in particular, I'm really excited because this week we have Janie, Janie Lee Grace with us. And um, Janie and I have known each other now for over a year. And Janie, you've heard me talk about the um, sober coach training that I have done that I went over to London and and took this course. And so I'm not going to steal her thunder because you're going to hear all about um, Janie and her life. But I'm so excited to have Janie on the show this week. And um, it's been kind of um, an event in the making and excited about having her here and and hearing her story. I'm excited because this week I'll learn a little bit more about Janie, maybe more than I already did. So I will shut up and stop rambling. Janie, I'm going to hand it over to you. Janie, how would you like to be known and what would you like people to know about you? Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I suppose I'd like to be known as someone who is super enthusiastic, um, totally passionate about what I, uh, what I, what I love. Um, and I suppose, you know, really in truth, I'm a little bit bossy, um, but hopefully in a good way, um, because I really am so determined to, uh, inspire people to, to live their best lives, particularly, um, around optimum health and wellbeing. I just kind of want the best for everyone. So I suppose that's how I want to be known as someone who is um, spreading a, a little bit of light around wherever possible. Mm, I love that. And I will say this is this is definitely how I know you. And and I think these are the things that I really enjoy the most about you. I was chuckling when you were saying I'm bossy, bossy in a good way, <laughs> but <laughs> determined. But, you know, I also think that that's part of because that's who you are and because you live into that, I also think that's part of um, the attraction. I think that's part of what brings people to you is because they admire that in you. They like to see someone who's fully embracing that part of themselves. So mm. I, yeah, I think did. you have to be authentic, don't you, in what it is yeah. you're, you're going after. <laughs> yeah, like we, you, you, can, you can call it bossy, but I think outsiders would say boss. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's an admirable trait. Yeah. JD, I'll take that. JD, I know we're going to get into your story, but what else would you like folks to know kind of before we get to your story? Uh, well, I suppose it's important to kind of set the scene that um, for many years, my my work has been around sort of health and well-being. Um, I suppose when I think back, uh, I've been kind of doing this for 
gosh, about 20 years, 20, yeah, about, about 25 years, actually. Um, I had my children late and when my first son was born, that was when I had my very steep learning curve, if you like, into mm. all things holistic health and well-being. So I've always been kind of known for that. My All of my work came under the banner of imperfectly natural. Um, and I'm really glad I had that title because I never did get everything right. You know, I always was imperfect. Um, mm. But then as time has gone on, you know, I still I still do that work, but it's it's now expanded. So it uh, it's, it's now about so much more, which, you know, we'll get to talk about. But I suppose all, all I'm trying to say is I, I, I think that um, I think my my whole thing is around everyone doing the bits they can and, mm. and being imperfect is OK. Um, I, I guess. Uh, I don't know that what springs to mind is that lovely Japanese phrase, uh, the kintsugi, where you've got something that's broken but still beautiful because they 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 seal it with with a bit of gold, don't they? So sometimes I, I wrote a blog post called "You Are Flawsome," meaning mm. you might be a bit flawed, but you're still awesome. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'm just throwing that in for what it's worth, in case anyone is aware of the the, the books that I've written and the the stuff that I've done in the past around uh, around holistic living. I, I love that. And I, I particularly love the the reference to Kintsugi because, you know, some people will look at it and say, oh, it's it's more valuable now because they put the gold in it. And it's like, no, the gold highlights the cracks. It's mm, like the exactly. cracks are what make it unique and different yeah. and and truly individual. So and I, and I love what, what came up for me when you were talking about imperfectly natural is like natural is imperfect, but then that's like nature is just perfect in its imperfection. Right. So I just love exactly. all the plays on words there because they're all, they're all meaningful and authentic. At least they are to me for sure. And, yeah. and knowing you as I know you and, and the, the people who have availed themselves of your, your wisdom and your services and your, and your guidance and support, everybody else believes that too, or many, many, many people believe that too. So I have to watch Thank how you. I use the word every <laughs> <laughs> Janie, we, we haven't talked about your story and so I'm excited to hear about it. But before we get started, I want to do with you like I do with all my guests. And as you think about the conversation ahead, the story you're going to be sharing with us over the next 45 minutes or so, what would be your intention for yourself in the telling of this story? Mm. I think, you know, sometimes when you um, share stuff, particularly when it just kind of happens organically, so there's nothing scripted. Um, I think often you can actually have a little light bulb moment for yourself, actually. <laughs> so um, I'm, I, I guess I hope that that will happen. It, it, it often does. You know, you'll be sharing something and you'll realize, wow, actually, I really, I really do. I really can see that that was such an important turning point for me. Um, so uh, I suppose that, that, would, that would be nice. Okay, wonderful. And, and, and I do see that over and over and over again, um, that in the retelling of the story, so many things can come up. Sometimes it's a, a self reflection or a validation. Sometimes it's, you know, releasing. Sometimes it's, oh, there was a new discovery there or something I hadn't looked at in a certain mm -hmm. way in, for mm -hmm. a period of time. So my intention for our conversation is to, to be able to create that space for you to, to uh, achieve your intention. And also what I know to be true with every single episode and every single guest is that in the telling of your story, someone out there will hear it and they'll hear a little bit of themselves in your story. They'll feel a little bit more connected, a little less alone, and in the best case, inspired mm -hmm. and empowered to do something that they were wanting to do in their lives. So yeah, hope so. Wonderful. Let's get into it. Let's jump into the questions. I ask every guest the same five questions. And so let's start with the first one. Where, Janie, where have you found yourself sitting on a comma in your life? Yeah, so the really big one for me, uh, where I was stuck really for so many years, was around this whole piece around drinking alcohol. So I've already alluded to the fact that I um, was queen of natural living. I mean, I, I had a couple of best-selling books. I was a Hay House author. Um, I, 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 my whole life revolved really around recommending natural products, and I you know, natural products and services. And I absolutely walked my talk, you know, I, I, I really was sort of queen of organic food and, um, you know, um, skincare without chemicals and washing your home with, you know, your clean, your laundry, even, you know, mm -hmm. every, everything, everything was uh, the non-toxic version, looking at the holistic approach to everything, 
spirituality piece. It was all in there. And I really prided myself on, on this holistic approach. But through it all, <laughs> there was this huge elephant in the room that was alcohol. Mm. And for many years, I, ge I genuinely didn't see it, actually, because, because I had my title, Imperfectly Natural. Um, I thought it was all really just quite fun that, uh, that I was imperfect and, uh, you know, having my, my, my vice was my... my uh, nightly wine i was going to say glass of wine but it was way more than that and mm. and so for ages i kind of just thought that oh well you know i'm imperfect and so that's the way it is uh, and i would manage to convince myself that um at least the wine i was drinking was organic or biodynamic you know like i like i realize now <laughs> what the hell difference does that make uh, but mm. at the time uh, that was my that was my line to myself uh, but as the years went by i absolutely knew that this was holding me back, that I was stuck in this, well, caught in the alcohol trap, really. And I, mm. I, I think I probably started to realize it um, a, good, a good 15 years before I stopped drinking, mm. <laughs> certainly 10 years. Um, so what would happen is I would just kind of go through phases where I'd start to be a bit concerned that I was drinking more than I should or I, I, I mean, it's important to stress that I never hit rock bottom. I didn't ever, you know, drive when I was drinking. I didn't ever have a day off work. I didn't really have hangovers, such was my tolerance. Uh, but mm. I knew I was drinking too much. And I'd wake up at 3 a.m. pretty much every day. And a little voice would be saying to me, this isn't OK. Like, what are you doing? You're meant to be holistic. You're meant to care about your health. Just stop it. And then I would kind of answer the voice back and say, oh, yeah, I, I, absolutely. That's dead right. I will, I will stop. I'm relatively successful. I can do stuff. I'll stop. Um, but then by the next day, I would um, start, start again. You know, the wine which would be in my ear telling me that it was a nice sunny evening and there out would come the Sauvignon again. And this went on for a long time. And there were times when I, uh, I thought, okay, I'm really going to address it now. So I'd buy a book or I'd, um, I don't know, listen to a tape or something. I'd, I'd sort of try and get my head around making this happen because I had an understanding that this was holding me back. Um, but I never really got off the starting blocks because I, there was a fear there, a kind of a procrastination there. Um, and I suppose um, it was what everybody did. It was what everybody did, mm. right? It was our social, you know, for everything from commiserations to celebrations. It's what everybody else did. So I didn't know anyone else like me. So it really, I really felt very isolated. And mm. so I really was stuck in that place for a good 10 years, possibly 15, knowing there was something going on, but not able to move forward from it. Wow. I, 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 I'd love to just jump in and reflect a couple of things and, and as such, such a relatable story. I mean, people know I, I too quit drinking about three years ago, uh, walked away from the alcohol. Right. And we've had plenty of conversations and I know in your programs, you talk about these things, but, but what I'm hearing in you is just this, this kind of contradiction, right. Between all the things that you stand for and represent. And then this thing that you're enjoying kind of, as you said, in isolation or in quiet, and then being able to rationalize it a little bit. Mm, no, absolutely. Uh, that, that's exactly yeah. it. I was, um, I suppose that, that, that lack of authenticity was the really important piece for me. It meant mm. that I couldn't, I couldn't be authentic. And when I look back, I realize that, so for example, I, I, I was a Hay House author. I was also a Hay House radio presenter. So I got to interview so many incredible people. I mean, unbelievable amount of, of spiritual gurus. And, you know, I'd, it, it was an amazing time. Mm -hmm. And so if you'd asked me during that period, really anything about meditation, spirituality, I, I had all the answers. Or, you know, I'd, I'd interviewed somebody incredible about angels or you know different aspects of meditation you you name the greats i probably interviewed them 
Um, and yet, mm, if mm. you'd asked me about my personal practice, I would have said, oh, don't be ridiculous. Um, I remember having a conversation about self-love with some Hay House authors. And it was really interesting because I realized that although I knew the stuff, I, I, my feeling was, oh, no, well, that's for everyone else. It's not for me. And of course, deep down, mm. I, I knew that there was something going on there. I knew that I wasn't authentic. I was preaching this stuff in inverted commas, and I absolutely believed it, but it just didn't feel like it could become real for me. It didn't feel like it was possible for me to be able to meditate or mm. start to like myself. And I, of course, I now realize why. You know, I now realize that when you're drinking alcohol, it literally lowers your vibration. It literally stops you from mm. being aligned and being in tune with who you really are. So, of course, I couldn't sit in, in meditation because, you know, that very uncomfortable voice would probably come in and say, right, okay, so uh, numbing out every night, are we? And, you know, um, and so it, 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 really was a, it really was a hell of a comma <laughs> for a long time. Yeah, well... And you describe this conflict in you, right? Like this, this, this voice that would talk to you at three in the morning and say, oh, you shouldn't be, and this is going against things and, and anti your authenticity. And yet these things, like you talked about, even meditation mm. specifically, like that's the place you go to hear the voices yeah, that you need exactly. to hear, the voices that are truest and authentic. And, and in addition to the vibration piece, if you're just not in a position where you're even ready or interested to hear or listen, then why would you go in a room where you're exactly going to be told? That. It always felt like there was something right? better to do, you know? So if I ever tried to sit and meditate, it was just too uncomfortable. And I, it was easier to just go and put the washing on <laughs> or whatever, because, mm, um, because I, mm -hmm. I had no idea how I was going to, stop drinking if that was what the voice was telling me to do because I didn't know anyone else like me I knew of people who you know needed rehab or what well, but that wasn't me I didn't identify with that I didn't know anyone else the only people I knew were seemingly very happy social drinkers allegedly I mean of course I now realize they probably weren't they were probably also waking up at 3 a.m but nobody talked about it Jenny, you said something earlier that I was curious about, um, because what I love about these stories is that the value that they have just in and of themselves and sharing them. And then also uh, what I notice, maybe it's just me, but I, I believe also it's like some of the little details, like the how did you in this case or what was that specifically like for you? It can be really revealing for people. You said you said specifically there was a fear and a procrastination there. What did that mean? What was happening there? Well, I suppose I knew that at some point uh, I was going to have to quit the booze. Um, mm. as, a, as time went on, I could feel the effects. I knew that I was um, waking up with not, not great energy. I knew that, I mean, one, one aspect was that I was I was terrified of getting older. I mean, somebody who works mm. in the media, it's never great. It's never great to be get, getting older. There's a huge pressure on you to, mm. to not, you know, which is crazy, isn't it? And, you know, much better to get old than not, right? Um, but, but there is a pressure on you to look good and all of that stuff. And I was never anyone who was, uh, a lot, I was never anyone who would sort of consider, you know, going and having facial surgery or anything. So, so as soon as, as soon as I started to kind of look old in inverted commas, it's like, oh God, I don't like this very much. Mm. Uh, I don't like anything about this. And I remember thinking, God, this is, everything is going to go downhill. I remember having that thought one day, I kind of looked in the mirror and thought, oh, look at, look at yourself. You know, you look really kind of bloated and a bit gray and a bit, and everything is going to get worse now. You're going to have less energy. You're going to start to get sick. You're going to be, I, I must, when I think back, I realize how, how down I must have been, how, how much the alcohol must have been affecting me because, you know, that kind of sense of, of, uh, of, of, fear really over getting old is crazy mm. um and and so I, but i remember thinking this feels this feels really scary i don't like anything about this um what can i do i'm I, i'm a i'm a problem solver i love finding solutions what can i do and i remember thinking i'll um maybe i could go and do another juice detox i've done some before um i could go and do another juice detox i could do a 
a, a bit of a boot camp and get a bit fitter. You know, I could go and do a, 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 med a meditation course. I'll, I, I had all these ideas of all these things I could do. I knew full well that I'd done things like that before. And at the end, and yeah, they might be great for a few weeks, but at the end of them, everything would all just come back to, to where it was before. Mm. And I remember thinking a little voice kind of flew in and said, well, you could try not drinking. And then it literally would leave as quickly as it had, as it had arrived, as it mm -hmm. were. But they, those were like the first little insights of, you know, actually, I would do anything I can to skirt around the one thing, the one thing that was the key to it all, the absolute key to it all. So I, I, I kept myself in that state of, well, fear, fear of getting old, um, you know, fear of making a, doing something different, procrastinating. The reality is I didn't know how to do it and I didn't mm. know anyone else either. So in a way, my fear is understandable, um, which is why I'm so passionate now about the more of us talking about this, um, the better, you know, the more of us bringing, sharing, spreading light on the mm. fact that there are millions of people drinking more than they want to. And you do not have to wait till you get to rock bottom before you can hop off the booze elevator. Well, and this this really makes so much sense. And it's like, you know, when we talk and I know in your, in your books and in your programs, you talk about the importance of connection and so forth. And this really kind of underscores it, right? Because when you were going through your experience, when you were sitting on your comma, there was this, as you've described in different ways, many times, this sense of isolation, not having an example to follow, not really knowing the answers and no one really to show you a different way or a different alternative. The voice inside did. The voice mm -hmm. inside knew what you needed to do. But in terms of for you out here, what does that look like or what do I do? You yeah. you didn't have the connection that now you provide for other people or encourage other people to provide for each other. It yeah, just exactly seems like that. how important it is, like how it shows up over and over and over again, story after story after story. I didn't know how. Huge, yet, yeah, huge, hugely important. I, yeah. I, what I needed, you know, I realize now I did have the logic around alcohol. In fact, for uh, during those years, I did have periods where I stopped. Mm -hmm. So I did do a juice detox retreat and stopped for perhaps uh, maybe six, seven months after that, um, fully, fully uh, NLP'd up, if you like. So I was brainwashed in a good, good way, in inverted mm -hmm. commas, recognizing just how bad alcohol is. And I was able to kind of keep going on on that logic piece. Until a day came when I was, I don't know, at an, I think I was at an award ceremony and someone asked me to present an award and then they put a glass of champagne in my hand because they were going to take a photo. And it's that thing of, well, I mean, I'm perfectly OK. Like, why, why would I not? There's clearly nothing wrong with me. I've just been, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's all good. And so I was straight down the booze elevator again because I hadn't done any of the work and I hadn't, I hadn't acknowledged any of the motivational piece i hadn't got the motivation that life was better without mm. i was purely running on the on the logic as it were well can can i jump in on that for just a second um then and i apologize if i'm breaking the flow but no, i'm not, curious not here I, this this really jumped out at me because i feel like this is such a pivotal moment that so many people will experience particularly on the journey with alcohol mm. and it can be other things too but what you said was, I did the juice detox. I basically found a way to quit for seven mm. plus months, right? And then somebody put the glass of champagne in my hand and back down I went again because mm. I hadn't done the work. That's right. What's, what would you say is, uh, there's so much here I want to unpack. So let me try <laughs> to keep it simple. What was the distinction between, well, I had quit for seven months and I'm okay now versus what it might have been had you done the work and I'm doing the yeah. air quotes now. Sure. So uh, many people I now realize do this. They go round the block, as it were, several times. They stop drinking for a while. And um, usually when that happens, they are focusing purely on what they're, in inverted commas, giving up. Mm -hmm. And as you know, I will not let anyone use that phrase because, as you said, words are really important. And actually, I now realize there is nothing to give up, mm -hmm. uh, nothing at all. And so 
what would have been different and what was different when I finally got to my last day one is that rather than focusing on what you're giving up, you focus entirely on what you're gaining. And that's where you need the motivational piece. So even though it can be difficult at the beginning, because anything hard and, you know, might be, you know, anything worth doing might be a bit tough. But if you focus only on what you're going to be gaining, that carries you through. I always use the example of, it's almost like a carrot on the end of a stick, actually, because I don't know if you use that phrase in the States, do you? Mm -hmm, we do, very <laughs> yeah? much <Okay>. so. <laughs> so. This yeah. is capitalism. So you, <laughs> good, okay. So you've got the kind of carrot on the end of a stick. You don't really know what it is you're going for. You can't, in fact, with sobriety, you really don't know. Because in a sense, most people stop because they've got to as it were, because they have to, because mm -hmm. if they don't, something bad is going to happen, you know, because you look terrible, because you feel ill, because your partner is going to, you know, leave if you mm -hmm. don't. There's usually a reason why you stop. And of course, the logic piece, there will be a part of you that knows it's really bad for you. Every single glass, you know, there are zero benefits to alcohol. Mm -hmm. Even one glass is harmful. Let's be clear. Right? Of course, I didn't know that at the time. But I had, I had a, a bit of an understanding of just how bad alcohol was, and I wanted to give my be myself the best chance of, of, of being healthy. Of course I did with all, with the, all the work I did. Um, but I had no idea. I had no concept of life being better. Mm. It was just a case of how will I survive now I've given up something. So it, the whole thinking is usually around how am I going to manage, how am I going to navigate being without this thing that everyone else, all the lucky people can have mm. it, but I can't. So how am I going to cope with this deprivation? And that's usually the mindset at, at some unconscious level. You mm -hmm. know, it's that, oh, well, I can't have it. So I've got to, I've got to deprive myself because I can't have it. So then, of course, you know, the unconscious mind really does not like that. You know, our unconscious mind does not want us to feel deprived. We want, we seek pleasure. That's what humans do. Mm -hmm. And so if everyone else is having pleasure, like, for God's sake, why, you know, I don't want a cup of tea. I want a nice glass. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, yeah. so, so unless you've caught sight of, oh, hold on a minute. I can absolutely have a nice glass without toxic liquid in it. And you know what? My life will be better on every single level but mm. nobody had ever told me that they told me stop drinking alcohol is bad for you the book that i read was fully nlp it was you must stop alcohol is bad you know I, and it was great by the way those books are fantastic they mm -hmm. they drum the logic into you and that is important so i had the alcohol is bad thing but I didn't have any of the motivation or anyone to look up, uh, look up to who was saying, wow, you know, you're going to want what I'm having. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's, that's what I needed. That's what would have kept me going if I'd had the carrot on the end of the stick. Yeah. Well, and, and I thank you for clarifying that. So what I'm hearing then to kind of summarize is the seven months that you were sober and then one event happened that sent you back in it sounds like you were kind of just complying and or doing the what you're giving up thing. And then when you eventually came back to sobriety for good, it was from a whole different place. It was then about yeah. all the things that you were gaining and how it was going to benefit you and so forth. And I see that yeah. so often too. Um, and it's not just alcohol, right? Alcohol obviously is is your story now, but it doesn't just have to be alcohol. The things that we make a conscious choice to leave or to walk away from – and and it's all about the mindset or the point of view, right? Oh, I'm now depriving myself of this, like you described, versus no, you're not. You're walking away from the unhappiness. You're walking away from the sadness, the pain, the suffering, the struggling, and all of those sorts of things. But look at yeah, all the things exactly. you're getting, right? Look yeah, at all exactly the things that. You're it's everything we can add in. You know, even yeah. when you know years ago when I used to go on diets, I remember thinking, oh, you know, Monday morning I'm going to go on a diet. And then, uh, you know, and, uh, and then Sunday night, you know, I'd kind of eat for England because, oh, dear, I was going to be deprived. Mm -hmm. And Monday morning, you know, when the diet started, I would be absolutely starving, starving by 10 a.m. And you know, because it's just all the mindset is oh, I'm mm -hmm. really hungry. I was mm -hmm. just in that mindset of, oh, God, I'm going to be deprived. Oh, no, how awful. Let me, you know, have a ton of, of biscuits or whatever. It's just mindset. And when we can focus on what we're gaining, it changes everything. And that, you know, this expression that I use a lot, 
emotions, not logic, inspire action. Mm -hmm. It's the motivation that's going to keep you going. We do need the logic. We really do. We do need to know how bad stuff is and, and we need to know why it's not good for us. Yeah, we do. But really, it's the motivation that's going to keep us going. Yeah, abs. And I love the call out to the fact that emo emotions and logic are both important in the mm. conversation. We live, we live particularly here in the West. We live in a world where oh, emotions are kind of downplayed and pushed aside. I think that's changing now or coming back. Um, but in in a lot of conventional corporate wisdom and management teachings and things like that, oh, you know, we're trying to kind of pull the emotion out of the conversation in the workplace. And and that's where people spend most of their time. And so that yeah. spills over into people's everyday lives. And then it affects how they're able to use these tools to navigate and function their lives. And so mm -hmm. it, they spend a lot of time reading the books to learn how to do the thing. And it's all logical and they haven't really solved their why. Yeah, exactly that. J Janie, the second question for you, you've already, I think you've answered this a lot, but I would love for you to add anything that you haven't. You know, when you look back at this comma that you were sitting on with the alcohol, and we, we haven't necessarily even like finished the story, like where did you land? But what did this create for you? I feel like you've already answered that question a little bit, but what would you add? Um, uh, uh, while I was going through that, you mean, while I was so feeling mm -hmm. stuck? Yeah. Well, it, yeah. it, it, it created... Um, you know, I can see it now, of course, I couldn't at the time, but it, it created um, a lack of inauthenticity, as I've already mm. said, uh, mm -hmm. I, I really, I, I, I felt, um, I felt off kilter a lot. I remember, um, I remember feeling off kilter. In terms of um, me, uh, uh, you know, as a kind of professional, as it were, um, I, I got away with it, you know, I, uh, nobody else would have noticed, you know, presenting wise and, and, and all the rest of it. I remember writing a chapter in, um, in my book, actually, about alcohol. And now I look back, I think, oh, my goodness, how can you have written that? Mm. You know, that was that was not authentic like stop it <laughs> so I look back now oh, god I can't believe I did that and then in terms of me as a parent oh my goodness I mean that's my only regret you know that I didn't do this sooner because I was definitely not as present as a parent as I could have been and I really regret that you know that that's the only regret because I can now see that when your focus is on alcohol it it takes you away from important stuff you know, even if that important thing is only reading a bedtime story, um, you know, the glass of wine is sitting there looking at you and, oh, I think I'll, you know, I think I'll skip this page. Um, and there'll be, you know, there'll be a lot of parents listening to this who, mm -hmm. who, who relate to this. It's a, it, it's a thing. Uh, it really is a thing. And, and, and also it makes you um, impatient. I think I was quite impatient and very, um, what's the word? Uh, What's the word where, I don't know, I was, I was kind of never satisfied. I was never mm. satisfied. I think that that's one thing that I've, I've really, I could never have imagined would come from sobriety <laughs> is this fantastic feeling of being able to be satisfied and just ex take experience joy in little things and just be able to come back to balance. I could never do that. I was always had, what's the, I don't know if you use this expression, ants in my pants. <laughs> mm -hmm. right? yeah. Always restless, always need, you know, bigger, better, faster, more, you know, I love that album title. That was me. Always, yeah. always, always needed something bigger, better, faster, more. Nothing was ever enough, ever. Um, you know, I, I, everything I planned was, I always had to plan everything around drinking. And so if we were going to the cinema, oh, I have to arrive early and go to the bar first. I'm just ridiculous now I think about it, mm. the amount of time I wasted. Um, and and I, couldn't, I didn't, didn't get to enjoy little things. And mm. I, I very rarely got to enjoy the moment, you know? So um, that's just a huge blessing that's, that's come from, from, from that. And, and, and back then, yeah, I, I was... Um, restless. Yeah. I, I so appreciate you sharing that. You're the first person that I can recall. My memory is not so good anymore these days. I think many of us post COVID, but, um, I don't recall ever having this conversation with someone and I can so relate to that 
and and then there's all these little kind of things connecting. We we hear all the 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 phrases, catchphrases, and words, and then the things from the different types of ways that people talk about quitting drinking. Um, but this restlessness is not being satisfied. There's that phrase that we use over here, like uh what is it? One glass is too many and a thousand is uh yeah. never enough not or something enough. like that. Yeah, yeah. But you know. So here's what I'm curious about. Oh my God, we could have hours long conversation on this. Um, this sense of not being satisfied. It's interesting because the alcohol itself does that, right? Like if you, if you, first of all, I want to acknowledge what you describe in your answer to this question is like, it, it is its own relationship, right? It oh, yeah. pulls you away from the other relationships. Absolutely. And once you have developed a big enough relationship with alcohol, then of course, by its very chemical nature itself, it keeps you wanting more, yeah. but there's, there's never an end. And that was something that I always related to. Um, you know, I was, I was definitely a volume drinker. Like it, it, I, I had my rules around it. Like we don't start until six o'clock when the work day is done, it's part of dinner and everything. But the idea of having two glasses and then going to or stopping two, three hours before you go to bed was like, who does that? Right. Mm -hmm. There's just, no, you got to keep it going until you just literally go to sleep. And this sense of not being satisfied, the restless, but the, it's never satisfied, never enough impatient. I, I'm just so curious, like where else was that showing up in your life? And, and what do you think the alcohol, what was it about the alcohol that contributed to that? I guess is the question. Uh, I think, I, I really think that when you're not able to um, like yourself, <laughs> mm. I think everything comes back to this, this feeling of, of being comfortable in your own skin, really, and being mm. able, coming back to balance and actually feeling authentic and feeling like you could like yourself. I'm not talking about ego here. I'm not talking about being e egotistical. It just is that self-love piece. Some people are uncomfortable with that expression, but most people understand what we mean when we talk about that sense of authenticity, that sense of self-esteem, that sense of being comfortable with who you are. But when something is off kilter, it's very uncomfortable. So I was, I was ignoring that the whole time. I was ignoring that feeling by just downing it, you know, covering it up with booze the whole time. Mm -hmm. So if I was feeling anxious, well, we, we can solve that with a glass of wine. You know, if I was, if I was ha you know, really feeling really harassed and massively busy, you know, I had four kids and, and a ton of work going on. So if I could escape in inverted commas and feel grown up for a bit, oh, that felt like a fabulous reward. So. You know, I would take off to the local wine bar. I mean, I'm amazed they're still in business, to be honest with you, because, you know, mm. if we if we had a, anyone looking after the kids, that was me round the corner, mm. you know, with my glass of wine and a book <laughs> thinking, oh, how grown up I really am. You know, I, I saw that as my self care. I mean, I now realize it was self harming. But at the time, it was me, you know, needing to sort of really I was just needing to get away. I was just needing to escape. And, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what the alcohol does. But as you say, you need more and more of it. So it, it literally takes you away from that, your ability to be able to tune in to what it is you really need. And of course, mm -hmm. what I really needed was a walk in nature or a bath with essential oils. Or, you know. Yeah. Um, and I and even I would guess even just like the option that many of us don't even consider, which is to just be still and just experience Absolutely. what the hell you're experiencing. Absolutely. Right? But of course, I can't I couldn't do that. I couldn't, you know, feel all the feels at that point because yeah. the voice would come back in saying, what are you doing? <laughs> well, and I wonder for you, Janie, too, this is a little bit self-referencing. So correct me if this isn't if this doesn't uh, apply to you, but. You're you're a go getter. You're an action person, right? Make things happen. And I don't know about you, but for me, sitting and being with the feelings, the default is always. And then what do I do with that? Mm. Like, there's something that has to be done, or there's some action that has to be taken, and then that gets really funky and uncomfortable. So, uh, yeah. like, what was it that made sitting and just being still and just being with it challenging? Yeah, I mean, I I, I really didn't like it. I mean, uh, it, it felt very uncomfortable. It felt like a I was very impatient. So, you know, s sitting down in meditation just seemed to be utterly pointless to me because where would, where would I go with that? You know, <laughs> if the thought, if any 
important, and inverted commas, thoughts popped in, um, I would, you know, choose to ignore them because, of course, they would, they would, but that would be the voice saying, actually, you aren't really being authentic with who you say you are. You're not actually who you're meant to be right now. You're not aligned. You know, why don't you try removing poison? You know, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, those kind of voices. And because I didn't know how to do that, and as we've already said, I didn't know any el- anyone else who'd done that either. So mm-hmm. I certainly didn't identify with someone who was at rock bottom. I couldn't have, you know, I mean, I did speak to a GP once. I'm sure many people have heard me share this story a thousand times on the podcast, but I, I did on one occasion go to see a, a doctor it was actually about vitamin d levels um mm. but the doctor was very helpful and and then i felt you know relatively comfortable and so on the way out i actually said i'm uh, there is something else i'm a bit worried about my drinking it really took a lot for me to say that really mm. took a lot mm. um but of course she just kind of looked at me and said well you you know you seem okay how much are you drinking and obviously i lied and they know you lie um and 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 said oh well, well you know two three glasses of wine a night and she just said oh well perfectly normal same as me you know just just have the odd alcohol free day you know, <laughs> god if i had a quid for every time someone had said that like i hadn't thought of that yeah um you know and then and so that kept me stuck again for another good few years because All of those thoughts that had been coming in more and more increasingly, that little voice saying, I wonder if, you know, you might get back to some kind of authenticity if you stop the poison. I wonder, you know, that Mm. that, those thoughts, I would try to push away when I voice them to someone who might have been able to help me. She just basically says, no, you're good. So I stay stuck again. And, 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 you know, by the way, I'm not expecting all doctors to 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 be able to support me with this not not in a million years because most of them are drinking as well that's absolutely fine but what she could have said to me is oh well well done you for noticing that that's not serving you Mm -hmm. and you know why don't you go and have a look at uh, i hear there's lots of stuff out there go and have a look at the sober club or whatever because i'm sure there's lots of support out there and connection for people who are drinking more than they want to. That's all she yeah. needed to do, you know? Yeah. Oh, and I, and, and I so love this because I was going to acknowledge you for that. It's like you were becoming more and more aware, aware enough to know what was right and what was not right for you, right? Like that's one of the central themes mm. about um, mm. these conversations that we have is you you went to the doctor looking for some type of support. You didn't get it, but you knew that that was not that yeah. You, yeah. you didn't maybe maybe it was like ah oh, I got a permission slip but deep down inside you knew that's not my answer yeah right no, I do. That, that's absolutely right I mean I saw ther- I saw therapists as well at, at, at the time and um, and again you know I'd have a therapeutic session for something and then often ask them you know what if they got any any tips for what seemed to be going on and it was just always the same answer you know mm-hmm. you seem fine Well, and and I love that you acknowledge the fact, something that I hadn't considered before, which is, and not that we'll ever know and not that we need to judge them for it either, but, you know, that response could be coming from someone who's exactly at the same level you are and and wouldn't even know, like, I don't have that answer myself. Absolutely that. Absolutely that. And, and, And I think this is where we need much more awareness so that you don't have to you know know the answer yourself but you just simply have to know that there is a world out there and mm-hmm. and be able to signpost you know be able to just if, if if more people know that there is a whole world out there of people choosing not to drink alcohol and living yeah. their best life without it <laughs> and and keep listening to that voice too right because that it's it, it so many things are important, right? Yes, there are things important, the facts, the figures, the statistics, the the publications and so forth. But at the end of the day, what is your voice telling you? Yeah, absolutely. Right? If you're yeah, waking does, up it, at 3 a.m., there's a reason. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if the, the, the pages say, you know, the papers say X amount of units and so on and so forth. How, what's the amount of units for you? What was the one too far? What's the part that doesn't feel right? Right. Like how, what, what relationship do you want to have with the drinking? So, yeah, exactly. I mean, I always you, say to, to, to people, you know, the question isn't how much am I, am I drinking too much, you know, because what's too much for one person is not enough for someone else. Mm-hmm. The, the only real question to ask yourself is, 
do I think that my life could be better physically mm. and emotionally without mm. it? And, and for some people, the answer will be, no, I have a shandy every Christmas, I'm good. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. But for a lot of people, the answer to that question deep down will be, hell yes. Janie, what did you learn about yourself as a result of sitting on this comma? Well, uh, I learned that um, I need to, exactly what we've just been talking about, that I really need to listen to my intuition because the intuition really was there and it was quite loud for quite a long time. Um, mm. Now, in fairness, to be kind to myself, <laughs> I genuinely didn't um, know where to go or what to do, but mm -hmm. perhaps I could have put a little bit more effort in finding that because, uh, because the intuition was strong um, and I, I needed to act on it sooner. I really mm. needed to act on it sooner. And I, 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 really, I really did learn that about myself. It's happened over other things as well, where I've had a, a strong intuitive sense and I've, I've tried to over, I've, I've overlooked it. And it always comes back to bite you on the bum. <laughs> Mm. It really does. There's, a, there's always a learning. <laughs> there's always a learning, isn't there? There really is. I, I feel like what you just shared is something that could be really, really powerful for people. Um, and this is where we get into the granular, right? You said, my intuition is a strong voice and I've learned that I should have listened to it sooner. Can you give us an example of something you've taken from that? Yeah, I mean, I think I just... Uh, it, it comes back to the same thing. It's the self-love and the self-acceptance, um, if you like, and acknowledgement that uh, that my own voice, it, it, you know, there's this thing about, I, I work with family constellations uh, as well. It's a mass massive topic, but in family constellations, we talk about the fact that your body knows when something is true. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I were to stand up now and, and, and say, my name is Kevin, <laughs> you know, however good an actor I am, my body knows it isn't true. When, when, you, when you know something to be true, if you, if you just take a pause, <laughs> you, you know whether it's true. You do know. Um, and I think it's, it's about recognizing that and being able to put that pause in so that you are willing to do what you know you need to do. It's, it, it really mm -hmm. is kind of that simple. But we spend so much time, I did, um, kind of chasing our tail, trying to ignore the voices, getting, mm. keep, keeping busy so that, we, uh, that we, don't, we don't have time to listen to that you know, still small voice. We are way too busy being busy, um, mm. people pleasing, you know, sorting everyone else out the whole time. So that there's no time left for poor old me, you know, the kind of martyr thing. Oh, I'm way too busy to do anything, you know. Um, actually, what it usually comes down to is we, we're not taking care of ourselves. We're not really putting mm -hmm. in that self-care piece because when you are properly taking care of yourself, you'll be factoring in a bit of time or at least not blocking, not blocking time for those moments of intuition. You know, even mm -hmm. if it's as simple as taking some time when you first wake up, you know, this is such a simple tip, but, but it made a difference to me. Rather than waking up and going straight on your phone or, or straight to the newspaper or straight to the radio, go within first mm -hmm. and check in with how you are. And, and if you're feeling unsettled, then reframe all of that. Find a way of bringing back that positivity because what we focus on, we get more of. There's mm -hmm. definitely no two ways about that. Mm -hmm. Where we f put our, our focus, that's where the energy will flow. We will attract, you know, your thoughts do create your reality. That is so powerful. So, and, and it's true. It's the law of attraction. And there's, there's so much content out there that, that folks can, can read and explore and unpack. And I'm hearing this theme of definitely slowing down, listening, 
trusting the voice and, 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 and you've talked about different voices here. So just for the sake of the conversation, I want to kind of clarify, there's the voices that would kind of, we, we call them in the coaching world. You're in this world, the sabotaging voices or like the, the inner critic or the ego, Mm -hmm. right? There's those voices. And then there's the deeper voices, the inner wisdom, the knowing the spirit, whatever you want to call it. Right. And we refer to them as voices, but as individuals, the way you distinguish between them, because one is very loud and chattery, the other one is very quiet. You have to slow down and you have to listen because it could be very easy for us Mm -hmm. to walk up to a glass of something and say, oh, I deserve this. It's self-care. This is my break. I earn this and so forth. And that voice is very, very loud. But if we take a pause for a second, then Mm -hmm. there's another quieter voice that's saying, is that really what you want? Is that, how's that going to feel tomorrow? What's going to happen next? Right. So the slowing down and the listening is what I'm hearing you say is take the pause so you can distinguish between the voices. Yeah, that's exactly right. And of course, the the piece that comes before that, which obviously, you know, really well, is that, you know, to remember that you are not your Mm -hmm. thoughts or your voices Mm -hmm. and they are not you you can observe them and it took me ages to grasp this i i when i look back i genuinely think that i thought that the uh, i had uh, another voice going on the addictive Mm -hmm. voice right literally the voice of the wine witch which i would have a like a proper conversation with, you know, an actual discussion. It would say, oh, look, there's a bit left in that bottle. And I'd talk back to it and say, you don't really need another glass. Oh, go on, you do. You know, and I I genuinely thought that was part of me, mm-hmm. right? Now, I'm not a, actually a super, stupid person, but I really <laughs> did think that I was, it was all one and the same. And I couldn't see how I could extricate myself in fact, you know, someone once said to me, oh, maybe you've got an entity. I'm like, oh, Lord, give me strength. Mm. I've got enough going on. Well, it, it, <laughs> it makes sense, right? I talk about this all the time <laughs> these days. Like it's it, 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 as we look at and understand, you know, the, the human mind and, and thinking processes today. No wonder in the Middle Ages they thought people were possessed by demons, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's yeah. literally what yeah. it feels like. I'm, I'm starting to do part two. There is a reason. There is a reason why they're called spirits, <laughs> but that's exactly, separate. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But yeah, so so it, I was really caught up in mm-hmm. this. And it was only when I was able to finally recognize I am not my thoughts. They are separate mm. from me. I can stand back and acknowledge. I can even appreciate. I can say, thank you. Thank you for trying to keep me safe. I know you want me to do what I've always done, but you know what? thank you, but go away. I won't be doing that. Um, And when we can literally see ourselves as separate, it makes such a difference. Because yes, the inner critic's always going to come in, of course it is, and tell you, you know, oh, imposter syndrome, you're not as good as everyone else. And look at Mm. your social media, it's rubbish compared to everyone else's social media, and, and, and on and on and on. But we can pause and we can ask, well, hold on, is that true? I mean, it's good. It's important to check if something's true. Yeah, you can check yeah. that, you know, is that thought that's just come in, that belief, is it true? Or is it actually just a limiting belief? In which case, maybe it's time to knock it out the park, particularly if it's a limiting belief I've had since I was five years old, for God's sake, that a, that a teacher told me. <laughs> Absolutely. You touched on something that's such a big thing. Uh, it's a big thing with me. And, and I think so much of the world is actually struggling with this right now. And you said you struggled with it for years and many people struggle with it their whole lives. But those voices, the thoughts, the especially in the fast paced world. And as you described, you like we, everything was moving so fast. You had so many responsibilities. You were impatient. So it makes it hard to to even like distinguish Mm -hmm. all these voices. But for anyone out there who is literally struggling with this same type of situation and those voices and the chatter and so forth, just know that it's like, that's not something you're going to fix overnight. There's no book, there's no workshop that's going to make that fix. But the one thing you can start doing now, regardless of what you believe about how doable it is, is just exactly what you just said. Like, just pause, sit down, be a cat. 
look out the window, do nothing. And even if you don't get anything out of it for those five minutes that you do that, if you start developing a habit of just doing that, no expectations, it will start, the the quiet voice will start being a little louder. Yeah, and, absolutely. And then, and then you'll get just enough traction to be able to then know what your next step is. But it's not an overnight thing. I mean, shit, I'm a... ICF certified life coach and been a facilitator and all these things. And I help people with these types of things and struggle with it myself. Right. So yeah, exactly. It, it starts with one step, like you said. It does. And, I, and the, I mean, the other thing that can be very helpful is, is journaling and just that stream of consciousness stuff, because mm -hmm. when you do that, you commit to, for a short amount of time, writing down every thought. So, you know, the journal, it might read, you know, I've got to buy a birthday card. I'm, I'm angry with so-and-so, but then what all always happens is there'll be a point in your journaling if you've committed to do I don't know three minutes or something there'll be a point mm -hmm. where you suddenly think I don't know what I'm thinking I don't know what to write so you've got to write that down because you're committed mm -hmm. to it but then what will happen is a thought will come in that you consciously try to edit because you don't want to write it down but of mm. course that's the one you need to write down and, and that was very powerful for me in the early weeks when I did that. It was very powerful because it was only when I committed to writing down stream of consciousness, all of the thoughts in completely random, not for anyone ever to read, but just literally mm -hmm. to get it out. Then I did start to recognize, OK, I've got some really deep rooted kind of fears and things going on here that that I've I've been editing all my life. <laughs> Actually, mm -hmm. I've committed to write them down. I'm bloody well going to write them down. So I would. And there's such a power in releasing it, right? Yeah. Such a power. It's that lovely phrase that Louise Hay uses, the founder of Hay House Publishing. She says, you can't clean the house until you can see the dirt. <laughs> oh, you so have true. to let it out first. And <laughs> most of us spend all our lives trying to keep it in. Mm, or hiding it. Right. Yeah, I, exactly. yeah. What I love about what you said is it's like it's actually you're you're transcribing. Like you don't exactly. don't translate, transcribe, right? Exactly. And then no you editing. Can see it. You can see it. Yeah, that's yeah. so good. And don't sweep the the dirt under the rug or behind exactly. the refrigerator, like clean it out. Janie, last two questions. Um, you, you've shared so much with us and I just love it. And I always love just the energy of the conversation because you can you just embody you know, the change that I believe you've experienced. So let me ask you the question, what's changed for you as a result of sitting on this comma? Oh, everything. Um, uh, since I ditched the booze uh, six and a half years ago, all of the things that you, that one might uh, hope <laughs> would change, have changed. I'm um, healthier. Uh, ho I think I look better. I'm definitely not scared of aging anymore. It's the best anti-aging hack ever. <laughs> mm. I mean, I no longer care if I look old, then mm -hmm. I look old, who cares? I've, you know, I've got so much more energy. Uh, so all of those things, you know, better sleep, all of the things that you would hope, um, but so much more. In fact, I, I, I remember it, it kicked in for me, it, it's different for everyone, but for me, it was around about three months. I'd been sober for around about three months. And I remember waking up and not quite recognizing what the feeling was. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of, because I was a lot more tuned in, it's like, oh, what's that feeling? And I realized it was a sort of contentment, mm -hmm. which for me was absolutely unthinkable. You know, un un nothing I'd experienced probably since I was a kid, <laughs> mm -hmm. like contentment. And even the possibility of joy, I, I sound like I'm getting all biblical now, but to be able to experience joy, which I had absolutely no, no sense of before, no sense. Mm. Um, so uh, it's changed everything. It's literally changed everything. It means that I um, can live my best life without needing to, um, you know, I can do the things I want to do. I can be authentic. It doesn't, I, I'm still imperfect, you know, imperfectly yeah. natural is still running, yeah. <laughs> but I'm authentically imperfect. Right. Um, so it, 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 yeah, it really, it honestly has changed everything. And I think that's one of the frustrations is it's hard to, you can't share all of the benefits because I, I'd be, I'd literally be here all day and then some because mm -hmm. actually it gets better every year. That yeah. was the other piece that I hadn't 
I hadn't imagined that that every single year that you're sober gets better. Mm-hmm. Well, and it, and it first of all, that's wonderful. And it seems that like all the things that you don't believe you can ever have when you're drinking are the things that you start to get when you yeah. when you in that relationship. But I also love this is the because I, I chuckle because you see these memes and it's like, oh, you know, how will we know? Like you see the kids like, Daddy, are there going to be people who don't drink when they come to the party? And he's like, yeah, there will be. And he's like, the kid says, how will we know? And he goes, oh, trust me, they'll tell you. <laughs> 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 this This is why, right? Because we're so happy. And yet, yet, each person walks their own path. And some of us, like yourself, you know, you take all these things and you, because of who you are, like enthusiastic and p- passionate and determined, you want to share them with everybody. But just because you experience them, you don't necessarily have to share them. Like you can experience those things and you can hold them for yourself as well, right? That's the beauty mm-hmm. about oh, the totally. journey. I mean, one of the really amazing things for me has been seeing the changes in some of the clients that I work with or people within the sober club seeing their, I I wish I could have videoed them. Oh, I so wish, Um, you know, I wish I could have got a glimpse of them on their first Zoom meeting or something. And then, oh my goodness, the way they change, the way they blossom and have all this confidence and suddenly find their purpose. That's really incredible. The way people, the the way people kind of um, um, suddenly go, do you know what I've, well, now I think about it, I've always wanted to start a charity and you know what, I'm going to do it now. Or I've, I've always wanted to climb a mountain or I've always wanted to write a book and I'm going to do it. And by the way, it doesn't have to be something massive. It might just be that someone go, says, I've realized that my purpose actually is just to be happy. And you know what, I'm going to focus on that. I mean, how cool is that, right? Yeah. Oh, if yeah. more people followed their purpose, which was to be happy, it'd be a much nicer world. Oh, and I, I love that. And and I I consume a lot of content on YouTube, always about self development, personal development, and so forth. And it's interesting because now I have the same perspective, right? That you've you've helped develop um, is there's the people that I follow who got sober and then got things. And then I follow a lot of people who are doing these things that I want to do, whether it's like nomad life or traveling or whatever. And it's interesting. Alcohol is never in the equation when I go looking for these folks. And it's like, oh, I like that they do this or I like that they do that. Or that's really cool. That's a good example. But when you go into their stories, almost all of them somewhere in their story is, and I gave up alcohol. Absolutely. It's it's so it's like go looking whoever it is that inspires you the most, whoever it is that's doing the thing that you really want to do with your life, and even if you don't even it's not even uh, crossing your mind to quit drinking right now. Look at how many people are doing the things you really want to do, and then dig deep enough, and I bet you a good percentage of them will say they gave up alcohol or mm. never drank to mm. begin with. Yeah, exactly. Janie, what does getting off the comma look like for you? I think it looks like. Being able to uh, trust your intuition, um, become curious. Curiosity is a very big piece of what I teach and talk about all the time because lots of the things we've discussed today, you know, the self-love piece, the, the, the being able to recognize that you are not your thoughts, these things don't come instantly. So if you can bring in the curiosity, that can change an awful lot. Mm -hmm. And once you become curious and open, it can change everything. So I think when you're stuck, become curious, listen, listen to what might be going on, Mm -hmm. listen to the intuition, and then become curious, constantly curious. And then that, that, that literally will attract the answers to you. Mm -hmm. And then you can take some action and, you know, go after it. (laughs) I love that. Well, and I love that. Attract the answers to you. And, and I might even add, tell me if you agree with this and patience. Yeah. Yes. You do have to be patient actually. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and, and, and the other piece is I think that, um, you have to be willing to be imperfect because a lot, a lot of people that I, you know, one of the things that you've heard me say when I, um, I, I work with, uh, sober coaches is you don't always have to get it right but you have to get it going, mm-hmm. right? I, I know too many people who, in their quest to get something perfect, end up never starting. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you have to become curious, you have to get, you know, 
get on the rungs of the ladder and you just have to get going. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so well said. And oh my gosh, we could go all day. I love it. Let's start to bring this to a close. Janie, as you look back on this story that you've shared with us and the conversation we've had, what would you acknowledge yourself for? Well, I'd acknowledge um, finally taking action. Mm. <laughs> I'd acknowledge uh, being being able to uh, to finally trust trust my intuition, uh, even though it you know was going against the curve and the and, and the status quo. Being able to trust my intuition, being able to um, be honest enough to accept that I'm. You know, I, I wasn't being authentic. That you know, that was it's hard to do. It's hard to do. You know, mm-hmm. um, and and then of course I had to come out and tell that and tell everyone else that. <laughs> so that was really yeah. hard to do. <laughs> um, yeah. but and, and yet did, you did yeah. it. I, I love that though. Yeah, you got it started. So uh, so yeah. So I, I I you know I acknowledge that and uh, and and I acknowledge that that I've been able to 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 use my use my passion and enthusiasm for uh for sharing you know my authenticity in this journey and fully recognizing and doing it without judgment because i fully recognize it's not the same for everyone else but for those it is then Mm -hmm. here's some inspiration hopefully yeah i i i also will acknowledge you because one thing that i know about you and that you've just continued to show us and model for us is that in addition to being um uh, imperfectly natural, you are unapologetically you. Yeah. So I'll acknowledge you for that. Yeah, I guess you have to be really, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> like, going everyone against else the curve. is taken. Everyone yeah. else is taken, right? <laughs> Go, going against the curve doesn't mean going against life. Jamie, we're going to put all the info in the show notes as well so people can click on the links. But tell us where can people find you um, if they want to learn more about you, your programs, or even reach out and, and connect with you, maybe have a conversation. Mm, yeah, I'm I'm there on social media. I'm very easy to find at Janie Lee Grace. Uh, you can uh, message me there. You find all my stuff there. Obviously, all my um, well-being stuff is at thesoberclub.com. And then all my imperfectly natural products, recommendations, uh, anything to do with natural living is all still rocking as well. Um, and I also do bits of media training. So, you know, I, I wear a lot of hats. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. But I'm quite easy to yeah. find. No, I love that. It's like life is a project and, and you you show us that too. So, Oh, and I'm writing a memoir. Oh, I must just tell oh, you that. Tell. Yeah, yeah, that comes out. You know, you'll, you'll love it. Actually. Okay. <laughs> In fact, I'll have to send you an early copy. Maybe you'll do me a little line for it because, um, yeah, a publisher asked me if I'd write a memoir. And I, and I, and I, at first I said, well, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm actually not going to say if you, if you're looking for kind of dirt, uh, you ain't going to get it. You know, I'm not going to say anything nasty about George Michael. I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, because there isn't anything. Right. And they said, no, 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 I'm sure you've got interesting stories. And I started to think about it and I realized that actually I've got a ton of interesting stories because, sure. you know, I've met a lot of great people and I've had a lot of fun. So uh, anyway, it comes out at the end of October. It's called From Wham to Woo, A Life on the Mic. Oh, I love it. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. You and I are going to have a conversation off the mic. I want it. I, okay. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. I'm happy to uh, do whatever you would like for it. So, and yeah, I can't cool. wait to see it. Well, and you've shown us too, right? Like this is one of the things that I love about this podcast is I, I joked a long time ago and I won't name the celebrity that came to mind, but it's like one of the biggest names. And But I had said, you know, this podcast is about people telling stories about themselves. This isn't about people coming out here and giving advice and having all the answers and I'm a millionaire and all that sort of thing. And I would say you're probably the closest thing to a celebrity that I have had on the podcast. But, oh, poor you. But no, no, I love it because you know what? Here's the thing. We're still all human beings and it's still about we your story, are. right? And so it, it doesn't matter if it was that celebrity who will not be named. I said, and even if that person comes on the podcast, they're still going to answer the same five questions, right? And so yeah. because this, it doesn't matter who you know. I mean, it does in certain contexts and certain things. But when it comes to the stories, like I just wanted to know about about you and your experience. And that's that's what's so great about this memoir that you're writing is you can spend all your time talking about all the other people that you know, and we would never know who you are. So yeah. I love that. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. One of the things that we do on the podcast, because it's such an important uh, part of what we stand for here, and also it's a part of your story, is I call it acknowledgments. And it's 
your opportunity to give voice to someone that might not otherwise get the voice or just needs to be acknowledged by you. And so that could be a cause or an organization creator or somebody in your life that you would like to give a voice to a shout out to or a little bit of a boost. Who would you like to acknowledge Mm, today? So I, I, I have to acknowledge Louise Hay because, um, you know, Louise, Louise Hay is, is just incredible. And, and the fact that she didn't even start Hay House Publishing until she was 60. Mm-hmm. How cool is that? Mm-hmm. It's never too late for whatever you want to do. And I was honored to be a Hay House author. I really was. And the amount of work that um, Louise Hay put out herself and also, of course, the whole, the whole publishing team was it, really amazing. So I think it's difficult to have. I find it quite difficult to have any kind of conversations around spirituality without somehow I end up mentioning Hay House or one of the Hay House authors mm-hmm. or whatever. So, so that's a big one. Um, but then much closer to home, as it were, uh, one of my dearest friends is Sue Stone. And uh, Sue is literally the most positive person I know. Mm. And uh, I, I, I just absolutely love her energy. Her books are fantastic. She's written A Wonderful World for All, a, a bunch of other books. And Sue is the person that whenever I'm having a bit of a down day or feeling a little bit, you know, a little bit blue, I just think, I just think of Sue and I, rem- and I remember her saying, her, her mantra, right, which is, I love life and life loves me. Mm. <laughs> and it's so simple. Mm. And, but when you say, you say it and you recite it, it's like, yeah, actually, that, I'm going to manifest that. I'm going to keep focusing on that. So um, she is literally queen of positivity, and I love her for that. Nice. Wonderful. Well, and we'll have their links in the show notes, too. Check them out, Um, books and bios and, and everything. I love it. Janie, thank you so much for being a part of this community and for coming on here and sharing your story with us. Obviously, you and I are going to continue to have ongoing interactions, and I'm looking forward to that. And I, I so appreciate you coming and sharing with us today. Oh, thank you. It's, it's been great. Great, yeah. great fun. It's such a fantastic um, podcast, Paul. And it's just such a great, great way of sharing all these amazing insights. So, yeah, I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you very much for that. Have a wonderful weekend. What an honor it is for me to witness these powerful stories. I hope you feel the same way too. Think about what you learned from this conversation. What stood out for you? What challenged you? What inspired you? And I encourage you to write it down in some form of journaling and reflection. Surprises can reveal themselves to you when you do this. And if you were moved by today's conversation, pass it along to someone you care about. Let's spread the word. Let's continue to build connection. And if you do discover something you'd like to unpack further, book a call with me and let's talk about it. My links are in the show notes. Be sure to like this episode, follow the podcast here on this platform and social media at Off The Comma. And feel free to comment and interact with these posts and episodes. Check out my website for workshops, events, and my sponsor community. I'm covering the costs of production by curating my own sponsors who align with our vision. Be sure to check them out. They're all powerful people and businesses. Thank you for listening to this episode of Off The Comma. As always, keep noticing and keep listening.